Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening uh, to all of you. And it is a pleasure to uh, join you here again uh, today for this seminar. And today the seminar will be on uh, George Butler as an influential church leader in our denomination a good long uh, 100 years ago. I've got a PowerPoint uh, ready to go, so I will um, share it with you. Let me see here. I just want to make sure that I see it. Just a moment here. Something, something is happening to my screen. I we can see. We can see your slideshow when you had it up. Yeah, but I have it on my second screen instead of my front screen, so I don't want to look sideways when I talk to you. <laughs> uh, just just a moment here. It's the first time that it's doing that. Here we go. Let's try this again. Okay. Technology. Sometimes your friend and sometimes not. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so let me see. Okay, something is not working. Just a moment here. Let me. Uh, you're fine. Okay, you're good now. Is that what you see? Do you see the title page? Just a single page. No, we're not seeing the right page yet, uh, Denny. We're we're seeing. Uh, I think it looks like your second page, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So something. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> no. Start uh, over. That's what I, I need to do. Uh, we'll just start over. Okay. How about now? Perfect. Okay, this is yes. the title page. Okay, this is the title page. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, well, again, uh, I'm glad to be with you. What I'd like to do this afternoon for this seminar is share with you some insights into the life of one of our former General Conference presidents, uh, George Butler, uh, and uh, share with you some of insights from his life, from his ministry, uh, some of the issues he dealt with, challenges, and uh, hopefully uh, make it interesting. Uh, we're going back into history of more than 100 years ago, and in that history, hopefully find some very interesting aspects of our own Adventist history that uh, we have forgotten and perhaps did not know much about. There have not been a lot of publications on George Butler. 45 years ago, Emmett K. Vanderveer published a small book of 128 pages called Rugged Heart, the story of George I. Butler. It was a small book published in a period of time when access to databases, to archives was not easy. And he did his best to write a very short biography highlighting some of the main events of George Butler's life but without really uh, going into much of uh, the literature, the writings of George Butler, his uh, huge amount of letters, these were not accessible to him. About 15 years ago or so, while I was still the dean of the seminary, George Knight approached me and asked whether I would be willing to consider writing a new biography of George Butler, part of the Adventist Pioneers series, and I said yes, not really understanding and figuring, thinking that it would be such a huge uh, project. And it, it, it has been. The book is going to come out in about a month and a half or so, I am told, uh, the early days of May. Uh, G.I. Butler, an honest and misunderstood church leader, will be coming out from Pacific Press I look forward very much to the birth of this uh, other child uh, in my life here after all these years of work on it. First, let me do a brief biography of Butler. He is not a known person today in Adventism. George Butler was born in New England in Waterbury, Vermont in 1834. That's almost 100 years ago in this little house right here 
on on uh, on the river in Waterbury, Vermont. This house had been built by his grandfather, Ezra Butler, who was one of the pioneer settlers of Waterbury. He was a Baptist minister, but like most people in those days, anybody with a relatively good education or even a, a short education would become an influential uh, uh, political leader in the community. So his grandfather served as a U.S. representative in Congress for some years, in fact, uh, during the War of 1812, and then also did two one-year terms uh, as governor of Vermont from 1826 to 1828. A Baptist minister, therefore Baptist family. Butler's parents are Ezra Pitt Butler and Sarah Grow Butler. Both of them were also Baptist, but became devoted followers of William Miller during the Millerite movement in the 1840s. And like all Millerite believers, right after the disappointment in 1844, they were also bitterly disappointed by the fact that Jesus did not come back. That's an important fact here of the biography of George, of George Butler. Butler was born uh, 10 years before 1844. So he is also one of those pioneers that had roots in the Mellorite movement. To this family, 10 children were born. Uh, as you can see, quite a long list here. Uh, George Butler is the seventh uh, or the eighth of, of the 10 children in red. And of the children also, three uh, died fairly young in age, two daughters, uh, died uh, within just a few years of their birth. And then there was a another boy, a middle boy, Abishai, who died age uh, 18 during an accident uh, in, uh, in the town there. Uh, all of the children that, that survived uh, infancy or youth uh, became Seventh-day Adventist or Sabbatarian Adventist except one the other brother of George Butler, William Butler, never became a Sabbatarian or Seventh-day Adventist, but all of his sisters became Seventh-day Adventist or Sabbatarian Adventist. The third name on this list, there is an interesting one, Anne uh, Eliza Butler was a, an assistant to Michael Belinda uh, Chahosky in Europe, and she died in Switzerland. Uh, of the children, of the other siblings, we don't have a whole lot of photos of them, but here are the four uh, surviving uh, sisters of George Butler, all of them fairly well known in, you know, 100 years ago or so. Aurora uh, Lockwood uh, was a caretaker for Ellen White's residence in the 1880s until, the, until Ellen White left for Australia in 1891. Martha Adelia Butler Andrews married John Andrews' brother, William, and while in Europe uh, helping John Andrews in his missionary work, uh, William died, and a couple years later she remarried to Augustine Bordeaux, who was also there at the time as a widower and helping John Andrews. Another sister is uh, Amelia, uh, Mary, uh, Amelia Butler Washburn, married a pastor in Iowa, uh, Calvin Washburn. We know the Washburn family a little bit more because of one of her sons, Judson Washburn, who became a very strong opponent of A.G. Daniels after the 1919 Bible Conference, arguing that Daniels did not believe in the gift of prophecy in Ellen White. And his campaign kind of led to the fact that Daniels was not re-elected in 1922 to the presidency of the GC. A fourth sister, the oldest one of this group, is Sarah Butler Whipple, uh, was the spouse of a fairly wealthy businessman in uh, Battle Creek. Continuing the biography, Butler married Lantha Ames Lockwood, in 1859, they were married for 42 years. Uh, Lantha was eight years older than George, 
She was also a New England, Vermont uh, girl, uh, born and raised about 10, 12 miles away from Waterbury. And the Lockwood family was also a Millerite family. Two George and Lantha were born three children. Uh, Anna, who died age about 13 uh, in 1874. Very sad story there for George Butler. He was away uh, when she died in California. And she got an infection, uh, flu of some kind, and just did not survive it. Uh, George and Lantha was, were really, really devastated by the loss of their teenage daughter. At about the same time, we have two uh, twin sons, uh, William and uh, Highland or Heland. Uh, both also uh, grew up to be um, uh, to be adults and and uh, fairly influential in Battle Creek. Continuing the biography of Butler, just a few more things perhaps to add is that George Butler became a very uh, important church leader in the 19th century. If you look at this list here, served as Iowa Conference President for a number of terms, all the way from 1865 to 1886, re-elected a number of times and in between did something else. Was also president of the Missouri Conference for about four or five years, although he was not really present there. Michigan Conference for two years, and the General Conference President two terms, from December of 71 to August of 74, that's about two and a half years, and then eight years from uh, October of 1880 to October of 1888. Would you notice that at, while he is serving as General Conference President, he is also serving as President of local state conferences, like Iowa, Missouri for two years, he is president of the GC and also of the Michigan Conference at the same time. Uh, that is an evidence here that I'll come back to a little later that he is having a lot of difficulties at, uh, delegating responsibilities instead of finding someone else to do some responsibilities of leadership. George Butler tends to think that he can solve problems that nobody else can. That will become a major weakness there for him. And also at the same time, he is president of multiple boards, uh, the Review and Herald, Battle Creek College, and so on. All of these responsibilities is a good segue to talk about uh, George Butler's health. Butler suffered from a severe burnout, a progressive burnout from 1886 to 1888 which forced him to take extended time away uh, from Battle Creek to regain his strength. The burnout was caused uh, by, you know, multiple factors. Overwork, that's, that's uh, obvious. Taking on too many responsibilities and not delegating them. Constant pressures to make decisions and to solve problems. He is the to-go person to solve a lot of problems in the denominations. After all, he is inheriting a style of leadership from James White. And James White, when the denomination was much smaller, was the one making all the major decisions. Butler is basically, basically following in his footsteps. Hundreds of letters to respond to, incessant travel from home, poor accommodations, poor food. Uh, the crises also over the law in Galatians, I'll come back to it uh, a little later. Ellen White's uh, severe rebukes of his leadership and handling of the dispute, all of this leads to a severe burnout that gets to be more and more progressive from 1886 to finally in 1888. He has no choice but to resign from all of his responsibilities at the GC session that he is not attending in Minneapolis. And then a couple of weeks later, moves to Florida, where he will reside uh, for about 13 years until he recoups and then uh, comes back into church leadership. A doctor predicted in uh, November, December of 1888, that if he had not retired and left his responsibilities for the church, he would likely have died from his burnout. He said in a number of letters 
in, during that period of time and uh, afterwards also reflecting on what happened, that during those months of late 1888, uh, almost daily, he had a fever of 104, 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I don't know how much that is in Celsius uh, for our folks there from Europe, but that is, that is really high. Uh, um, normal human temperature in Fahrenheit is 96, 97, and he is doing 104, 105. So he was severely uh, sick uh, uh, during that period of time. So at the end of 1888, he retires, or they retire, to uh, Bowling Green, uh, Florida. And it is during that period of time, a couple years later, in March of 1890, that his wife, Lantha, suffers from a severe stroke. And she is partially paralyzed. I think it is the entire right side of her body is paralyzed for the rest of her life. She really becomes in, invalid. Uh, Butler, George, is really caring for her. She's not able to walk. Um, she can use only the left hand, uh, speaks uh, slowly and also with difficulties. But George remained faithfully devoted to her for all of those years. And she finally dies after this very long illness at the age of 76 in November of 1901. And the last two years being much more difficult uh, for her and also for him. Her health, you know, declined severely in the last two years. Within a month of Lentha's death, he is returning to active church work at age 67. Yes, please think about that. He is an active retiree. He becomes president of the Florida Conference just a few weeks after Lantha dies in November of 1901. In fact, they vote him into pre the presidency in his absence. He arrives a couple days later to find out that he's the president of the conference. It was during a camp meeting. And he will serve as president of the Florida Conference for three years. Now, two months later, in January of 1902, he becomes the president of the Southern Union Conference. So there you go again, uh, uh, double duties, president of the union and president of a conference at the same time, overlapping the two. Uh, again, lack of uh, difficulties of delegating uh, responsibilities. And he finally will retire from entirely from all church responsibilities in January of 1908 at the age of 73. Butler is a prolific writer. Between 1889, so when he resigns from the GC leadership until 1901, during that period of time when he cares for Lantha, he wrote more than 200 devotional articles for church papers, the signs, the review, and a couple more. And then after his final retirement in 1908, another 80 devotional articles. Altogether, during his entire life of ministry, he wrote five books and over 500 devotional articles. You add to this a huge correspondence that has been preserved of well over six or 700 letters, many of them 20 to 40 pages long, handwritten, and then also remarkably, uh, Butler and Dr. Kellogg exchanged over 175 letters between 1899 and 1906, when finally uh, Kellogg uh, leaves the denomination and the correspondence between the two uh, ends. A huge amount of, of data and information about Butler and all of his influence also on the denomination. But life is not stopping for him. In October of 1907, that is just a couple months before he finishes his presidency for the Southern Union Conference, he remarries to Elizabeth Jane uh, Work Granger, who is the widow of William Granger, who had been president of Pacific Union College, in those days, uh, Hillsburg College. 
She is nine years older than he is. They have a beautiful marriage, a beautiful life together until he dies in 1918. Uh, a, a good relationship, a beautiful relationship between the two of them. She will uh, outlive him by a few years until 1927. We have a few photos of George Butler in his older life. Here's one taken at the General Conference uh, meeting at Loma Linda, California, 1915. We have him here with Stephen Haskell, John Loughborough standing in the, between the two of them. Loughborough was a very short man. And that's probably why the other two are sitting, because the other two are very tall men. And then George Butler is on the right. Uh, and very old, much older, one of the last photos of George Butler around 1917. And then uh, finally, uh, which is probably the same one here, the single photo is taken from this one, where we have George Butler with Stephen and Hetty Haskell, at, uh, at Bowling Green, Florida, at Butler's home in 1917. Butler dies in 1918 while attending, uh, right after attending a GC session in California. He is buried in Bowling Green, Florida, a very uh, unassuming uh, headstone for his grave beside Lantha and also beside his sister Aurora Lockwood, who had come to live with them. And on the stone there at the bottom of the stone, a very simple statement, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. That's just a short biography of Butler. Uh, much more is in the biography that I have written that you will be able to find. This afternoon, what I'd like to do here for the next few minutes is highlight for you a few epochal or great moments of Butler's life that became defining moments of his life. There are many I could uh, highlight. In fact, if I go to the very last slide of this presentation here, let me put it up on the screen right away. Uh, I could. What I'll do here this afternoon is talk a little bit about the Wokon clan and what that meant for church organization and conflicts uh, in early Adventism of the 18. 50s, 60s, 70s, the conflict over the law in Galatians that uh, uh, came to an end uh, in 1888, and then a very complex relationship with James and Ellen White. I'll talk about these here this afternoon, but I could talk also about a lot of other things that you will, would find quite interesting. It is Butler's philosophy of leadership that created a lot of angst and a lot of conflict and a lot of disappointment in the 1870s. Uh, out of a pamphlet he wrote to support James White's authoritarian uh, style of leadership. We still talk about it a little bit today. In the 1880s also, uh, Butler wrote a, a series of articles on, the in on inspiration as a theology of inspiration, just to try to understand not only how scripture is written, but indirectly to try to understand how Ellen White wrote her books and how you make sense of a ministry, Ellen White's ministry, that's less than perfect, that they could see uh, some weaknesses with some of her writings. We could talk also certainly at length about Butler's and uh, Kellogg's correspondence about pantheism and uh, the separation of from the denomination of both Butler, uh, or both, excuse me, Kellogg, and the Battle Creek Sanitarium in the early 1900s. A fascinating little tidbits of history that has not really been uh, seen from Butler's perspective. And then also another beautiful aspect that is not really known. It is Butler's great influence on the development of black institutions in the South, especially the Oakwood Training School, today Oakwood University, in uh, while he is president of the Southern Union between 1902 and 1908. Butler was very influential in the establishment of a number of black churches, black schools, and particularly the Oakwood Training School. We could talk about that as well. Hopefully, uh, the book here uh, will be able to fill in some of those gaps. But for today, let me talk about three big moments of Butler's life. 
The first one, I'd like to talk about what happened in Wocon, Iowa in the 1850s and early 1860s. In 1855 and 1856, many New England families, uh, Sabbatarian families, emigrated to Wokon, Iowa. It is a tiny little village in the northwestern corner of the state of Iowa, not too far from uh, Illinois on the uh, uh, east and Minnesota to the north. And while at the same time, same year, the White family moves the Review and Herald Press to Battle Creek, Michigan. So what you have here is that the social dynamics immediately created two centers of influence within a very small and yet unorganized denomination, one in Wokon and then one in Battle Creek. And that is not to be missed. What we have here is that we have a number of families, very influential families, who have moved to Iowa. You've got the Andrews family, the Stevens family, Smith, and the Butlers, among a number of others that are also in Wokon. So the John Andrews family, Uriah Smith, Cyprian Stevens, and the Ezra Pitt Butler, and also George Butler at the same time. What's happening here is this, is that Angeline Stevens, the daughter of Cyprian Stevens, who has had a feud with James White for probably a decade by then, married John Andrews. Harriet Stevens, the other daughter of Cyprian Stevens, married Uriah Smith. William Andrews, the brother of John Andrews, married Martha Butler, who is the sister of George Butler. And then years later, this clan continues to have some kind of influence between themselves because Helen Butler, one of the twin sons of George Butler, married Clara Kellogg, whose sister, youngest sister, to John Harvey Kellogg. And then Martha Butler Andrews, who was by then the widow of William Andrews, married Augustine Bordeaux. So you've got a number of families here who are all interrelated by marriage. They are not connected to the Whites, James White, Ellen White, any of their sons in any ways. And that creates what you have here, a huge clan that has a lot of influence in early Adventism. And if one thing happens to one of them, the others tended to take their sides. It's family business, it's family feuds, it's also family conflicts and allegiances. And th basically, that's what happens here. You've got this clan, or I would call it the walk-on clan, that is interrelated by marriage. And they form a power base of influence in near constant tension in the 1860s and 1870s with a very strong-willed and somewhat dictatorial James White and his very influential wife, uh, Ellen White. I would recommend some other biographies of uh, Uriah Smith and J.N. Andrews who have uh, helped us understand some of those conflicts coming out of Iowa between all of these families. I think the biography I have written about Butler adds, builds, on what has been found and on Herthard in these other biographies. So that's a fascinating aspect of uh, George Butler's life here uh, that sets the tone that will happen uh, some years later between in his relationship with James White and also with Ellen White. The walk-on clan is very influential in Adventism. Another moment, perhaps the one we know best, is the conflict over the law in Galatians in the, and the Seventh-day Adventist message and mission. Here's how it all begins. Ezra Pitt Butler is a former Millerite. And like all Millerites, he is also disappointed right after 1844. In late 1849 or 1850, thereabout, Joseph Bates is the the first former Millerite Sabbatarian Adventist to visit Ezra Pitt Butler's home in Waterbury, Vermont, to try to bring them hope 
when it comes to the delay of the second coming of Jesus and also how to understand the importance of the Sabbath in the second coming of Jesus. So Bates visits the Butler home in Waterbury and first converts Sarah Butler to the Sabbatarian Adventist message. And then a year later, approximately, Ezra Pitt Butler becomes also a Sabbatarian Adventist. So we are about the year 1850. How is it that Joseph Bates can convince a Baptist family to become Sabbatarian Adventist? And here's a very important theological aspect of the conflict over the law in Galatians that has not been clearly established or discussed, I think, in years past. What convinced Ezra Pitt Butler to accept the Sabbatarian Adventist message was Joseph Bates' explanation of the strict distinction between the eternal and immutable law of God, the Ten Commandments, written on two tables of stone and placed inside the Ark of the Covenant in the sanctuary there in the wilderness, in contrast to the other temporal ceremonial laws written on a parchment and placed beside the Ark of the Covenant. So when Bates explains this difference in the Old Testament between the eternal immutable law of God, which includes the commandment on the Sabbath, and all of the other ceremonial temporal laws, and there's a difference between the two, one is immutable and eternal, the other one done away or canceled at the cross, that distinction helps Butler and the whole family there understand that the Sabbath is still to be kept and that the Sabbath is an eternal commandment of God. That distinction helps this Baptist family become Sabbatarian Adventist, but it also helps them make sense of two big passages of the New Testament in the writings of Paul, Galatians chapter 3 and Colossians chapter 2. These are difficult texts for Sabbatarian Adventists, but if you understand them knowing this clear distinction between these kinds of laws in the Old Testament, then you can argue that the law that Paul refers to in Galatians 3 is the ceremonial law. How do you know that? Well, it's because of what it says. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. That's Moses. The law was given to Moses. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we no longer need this guardian. So for Butler, for Bates, this, these two passages referred to the Old Testament ceremonial laws. It had nothing to do with the eternal law of God. And in Colossians 2, when it mentions festival, new moon, and Sabbath, these are the ceremonial days of feasts and Sabbaths. It is not about the weekly Sabbath, which is eternal and cannot be abolished. That is a crucial distinction for Butler. George Butler inherits this theological New Testament interpretation of the distinction between the laws. That's key for him. That is key to understand his view of how to make sense of Adventism, Sabbatarian Adventism. So when in 1886, E.J. Wagoner, out there in Oakland, California, as a co-editor of the Signs of the Times, began to teach an interpretation of the law in Galatians as referring to the Ten Commandments. It fundamentally undermined Butler's understanding of the Adventist message that his father had accepted from Joseph Bates. And for him, for George Butler, that crucial distinction between the eternal immutable law of God 
and the ceremonial law was done away with by Wagner. And therefore, that completely undermines what Butler understands to be the Seventh-day Adventist identity in mission. If you undermine how you understand the law and the Sabbath, what's the point of being a Seventh-day Adventist? And so, following the example he received from James White, George Butler believed himself to be the leading overseer of doctrinal orthodoxy in the church. He personally took on the issue and defended the established view regarding the added law in Galatians 3 as referring to the ceremonial laws. For him and many others, Uriah Smith, uh, Morrison, uh, other conference presidents, and so on, uh, you could put in that, uh, if he had still been alive, you could put in this group also John Andrews. To yield on this point was tantamount to give up the foundations of Seventh-day Adventism, the old landmarks. And so Butler said, no way, this cannot go on. And re really, it became a huge fight, a huge disagreement between the old timers, many of them who had roots in the Millerite movement in the very early years of the Sabbatarian Adventist movement, and this second generation of young Adventists, E.J. Wagoner, A.T. Jones, and some others who had a broader understanding of the word law in the New Testament. So that became a big conflict. Not to be forgotten is that in 1876, James White had published this pictograph to explain the Seventh-day Adventist understanding of, of Bible truths. And if you look at it carefully, doesn't it stand out that right in the middle of the picture, the Ten Commandments are a whole lot bigger than Jesus on the cross? The law tree, as it is called, draws the attention of those who look at this picture. Jesus is really secondary. In fact, Jesus is smaller than any of the pictures or the little um, figures there on the bottom left. Adam and Eve being cast out of Eden. Uh, Abel uh, being killed by Cain. And then the priest and the sanctuary service, all of these figures are a little bigger than what Jesus is. And then the on the right, you've got the two Christian ordinances and the far top there, you've got the New Jerusalem. So how the way of life, as explained through this pictograph here, you know, we say our picture is worth 10,000 words. So there you go. Keeping the commandments of God is the way of life to go from paradise lost to paradise restored. I take also on John Milton's uh, two books. So when you get to Minneapolis in 1888, uh, no wonder there was such a big fight. At core and at issue here was the understanding of salvation itself. Do you need to obey the commandments of God in order to go from paradise lost to paradise restored? Part of the whole intriguing uh, situation here is that a couple years after James White dies, Ellen White republishes this picture of James White, but under a different title in a very different pictograph. 1883 here, Christ, the way of life. If you notice, the law tree and the Ten Commandments are gone. The shadow of the cross is bigger than any of the Old Testament figures in the bottom right. The law has completely disappeared. It's not there anymore. No allusions to the Ten Commandments. There's a vague, vague one top left. Mount Sinai is pictured there, but you've got to know what that is. Jesus is front and center. Jesus is very big. This picture will have a long lasting uh, influence in Adventism because it will lead people to refocus Adventism away from distinctive beliefs to core Christian beliefs. And over time, that will have a big impact in Adventism. Let me conclude with a third major moment of Butler's life. 
And that is a very complex one. And it is the complexity of the relationship between George Butler and James White, and particularly with Ellen White. I hope that through the biography, uh, as you read it, you'll be able to uh, find more about the complexity, more of the details, how it happened, and why also it happened. It is a very complex relationship. And here are some of the reasons why it is so complex and difficult. First of all, they knew each other fairly well. They were about the same age, although George Butler is younger than James and Ellen White. But, you know, uh, it's not a generational gap here. It's more like older sister, older brother toward, uh, you know, the younger brother, uh, George Butler. When George Butler reluctantly, reluctantly, took the presidency of the General Conference in December 1871. In fact, effectually, it is in late January 1872 because he refused to become General Conference president. They voted him in absence while he was sick back home in Iowa. James White had, by then, had uh, probably three strokes by then. James White was exhausted. He needed some help, but refused to let go of his micromanaging many of the day-to-day -day activities of the church, even though it had to be done by letters. Making, making things more complex also is the fact that Ellen White had also repeatedly said that James was the divinely chosen leader of the denomination. In fact, she had said that and written about this just a couple months before December 1871, when they visited the town of Bordeauxville, Vermont, and then published it into a testimony that came out about December 1871. The chosen leader of the denomination is James White. Well, hence, George Butler could only expect to be a temporary replacement for James until James felt better. He didn't want to become GC president, but was forced into it by James, and then finally uh, by Ellen White telling him he ought to take it. Butler was hesitant, cautious, and often undecided in making any decisions during that period of two and a half years that he is GC president until August of 1874. And that greatly displeased James White, and in time it also displeased Ellen White. The fact that George Butler constantly wrote letters to James White telling him about this issue and that issue, what would you do, what should I do, that, in fact, that basically said or intimated that George Butler was not the president, in fact, he didn't believe he should have been, but James White continued to be the president. And so James White did not get a relief because he had to answer all these letters from George Butler. And that upset, therefore, Ellen White as well. Well, James White returned to the presidency. He shouldn't have, but he did in August of 1874. And George Butler gladly returned to Iowa and returned to evangelism and then also in time to the presidency of the Iowa Conference. A few months later, in January of 1875, Ellen White wrote to Butler a scathing rebuke about the fact that he had been such a poor and unreliable president of the General Conference during the last two and a half years. He is no longer the GC president. So retroactively, so to speak, she wrote to him this scathing rebuke, and then, within a week or two, it is published in one of the testimony pamphlets. And publicly, he feels very shamed by this testimony being released publicly to everybody else to read, and everybody knows that this is talking about him, even though the name is withheld and that he had been such an, an inefficient uh, church leader. Butler felt utterly 
humiliated by the fact that this testimony had been made public and therefore decided to completely severe uh, sever his relationship from James and Ellen White for about three years. The tension between the three of them is so tense that uh, there are a number of evidence for that, letters that have been written, that uh, Ellen White would say to somebody or James would say to somebody, well, we're going to this camp meeting in the Midwest. Well, we hope that Brother Butler is not going to show up. We don't want to see him. And then, well, they come to the Iowa camp meeting in 1875. And you know what? Uh, George Butler is not showing up. He's going to do evangelism in Missouri or somewhere instead of be, uh, being at his own uh, Iowa camp meeting. They cannot be in each other's presence. That is one way that Butler coped with the difficulties of the relationship. Instead of being there, having arguments with them, he simply uh, effaced himself, uh, stayed away, so that there would not be any public conflict uh, with uh, the two you know, leaders of the conference. It's a good, good side of him here. Well, while George Butler accepted Ellen White's gift of prophecy and enrolled in the church, he never understood her as being infallible and beyond the possibility of making mistakes, of misunderstanding, of misinterpreting events and situations and people's motives, which really began with this scathing rebuke in 1875. And from that moment on, in the back of his mind, even though George Butler and Ellen White had a long relationship with each other, George Butler never really completely, totally trusted Ellen White, was always a little bit afraid that if he got on the wrong side of her, he would be publicly shamed or rebuked. And that would, again, you know, go into a, some kind of spiral downward and make him feel very uncomfortable. Um, he was always a little bit afraid of this. So even though, on the one hand, he himself is a tenacious, strong-willed, difficult church leader at times, he is also somewhat a little bit afraid of what Ellen White would say and how she would understand things. For him, the messenger of the Lord is not infallible, and that comes through a number of times in his relationship with Ellen White. It happened in January of 1875 and the one or two years thereafter. It happened again in 1886 to 1888 in the debates over the law in Galatians, and he could not understand the letters that she wrote to him and Uriah Smith, castigating, rebuking them for their stand uh, towards uh, Wagner and Jones. Uh, Butler felt that he was right in opposing their theological points of view on the law. He felt also that Ellen White was not genuinely honest in kind of siding with Wagner and Jones when Butler knew that she understood the law in Galatians like he did, and so that really puzzled him. It happened the following year in 1889 when he left, uh, well, he left Battle Creek for Florida in uh, December of 1888, but thereafter, in 1888, uh, early 1889, there's a huge disagreement between him and Ellen White over why he retired to Battle Creek uh, to Florida from Battle Creek, did not stay in Battle Creek, did not want to have anything to do uh, with uh, the leadership in Battle Creek after what happened. Particularly, he did not want to be in Ellen White's environment. It happened again one last time in 1907, just a few months before he left the administration of the Southern Union Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. There is a huge disagreement between him and Ellen White over the leadership of the Southern Union Conference uh, there in Nashville. And uh, Butler is convinced that Ellen White is misunderstanding the facts and she is siding with Edson White and not really understanding what's happening. It was difficult 
for Butler to work with a living prophet. And his life portrayed that a great deal. Let me end with this little anecdote here. In 1907, Ellen White's nephew, Frank Belden, corresponded with Butler a few times, a number of letters, not, not too many, but a few letters, wanting to know if he could recall his understanding of the role of the writings of Ellen White, his aunt, within the denomination. So recalling some of the events of the 1870s, of, of the 1880s, and, and so on. You know, what do you recall of what happened between you and Ellen White? On one of the letters that he received from Butler, Belden added a handwritten comment. Butler told me, when I asked him why he was leaving Battle Creek, that's in December of 1888, for Florida, he said, because I cannot agree with your Aunt Ellen. And so he's leaving. And here's the handwritten comment added at the bottom of the last page of that letter from George Butler. That's handwritten signature from Butler. And you've got this comment here uh, from Belden. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'm probably sure a lot of comments and a lot of questions may be popping up in your minds. I could say so much more. Uh, uh, the biography has 600 and some pages. Oh, it's a huge book. <laughs> it's a huge book. Um, so there's a whole lot more that could be said. A lot of anecdotes, a lot of historical facts, a lot of interpretation. I hope it is helpful to get a good, better sense of those years of Adventist history that is largely been forgotten, I think, in Adventism. So thank you for your attention. Uh, Lauren and Gina, there we go. Um, uh, back to you. Thank you. I'm just going to give some direction to people who are here for the first time. We've just heard the conclusion of the presentation, and this is the time when we engage in conversation and a question answer period, or people can make comments. You can do that by raising your hand. If you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon that looks like a hand that says raise hand, and I'll call on you in the order that your hands come up. Um, I just want to say, uh, Denny Fortan, the, um, it looks like you had a lot of primary source material to work with, and that makes it very interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and go to Lauren, whose hand comes up first on my screen. Lauren, I think you're unmuted, so go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> As I was listening to this last part, Dr. Fortan, it, it occurred to me, I, I've actually often wondered how many people were, you know, we, we read these testimonies and they're all published in books and they're supposed to be anonymous. I've often wondered how many people disappeared from the church because Ellen White published a private letter to them publicly, even if she didn't put their name on it. Uh, there, there's, there, there were probably a lot of, of uh, cast-offs that came about because uh, Ellen White thought her, she, she had the permission to uh, excoriate people publicly. Uh, but, uh, but I guess my, my question is, I, I really think that the, the question, the, the discussion should be more about, about the, uh, uh, the, the law in Galatians and that, that uh, disagreement between them. But what I want to ask about is this, and it just hit me, I've often wondered this. It sounds to me, as I listen to the various people who knew Ellen White during her life, like there, there was a range uh, uh, among people of how they accepted her and what they thought of her. Uh, that, that there were people who were extreme Ellen White believers. I, I get the impression that uh, perhaps Haskell was one of those who, who just absolutely worshipped her. She was she was uh, as great as any Bible prophet, or greater, perhaps. And then there are others, like those who spoke up in the 1919 Bible Conference, who had some doubts. Do you have a sense of how these major figures in the denomination 
regarded Ellen White during her lifetime while she was still speaking and preaching and writing. Uh, surely uh, Butler wasn't the only one that that got uh, hurt by her, uh, but still stayed with it. And so we know, I think there are probably a lot of people that were hurt by her and just disappeared from the movement. We don't even know. But do you have a sense of, of where each of these people stood? Did they see at the time Ellen White being an absolute perfect mouthpiece like some of our brethren and sisters do now? Or did they have a much more realistic view of, of who she was and what she could do? And were, those, were there even perhaps those in church leadership who just said, no, you know, I think this is, this is a little crazy. I'm not sure that I buy this whole prophet thing at all, but I brought... But I buy the Advent movement, so I'm going to stick with it and shut up about it. Hmm. Uh, Lauren, thank thank you for your questions, comment, very perceptive, and uh, I think you're right. Uh, there were a lot of nuanced relationship between Ellen White and some of the early pioneers. Any of them who knew her personally had been in her home, had lived in the same village, Battle Creek who were fairly close to her children or some family members, you know, and so on, or, or traveled together mm -hmm. at some camp meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those who knew her personally knew that she was just a human being, that she was not, you know, uh, a divine being that had come from heaven, and that she had her weaknesses. That she, she had her moments of, of uh, her own personal anxiety, personal issues, misunderstandings, and so on. So you have that kind of relationship that I described here very briefly. The book goes into many, many of these examples and gives the, the reasons why this is happening. Many of them, John Andrews, Uriah Smith, and their spouses. And, uh, you know, we, we don't talk about the women, but the, the Stevens daughters who married Smith and Andrews and all of the others Oh, and Lentha Butler, they they were upset with Ellen White many times, and they received personal letters from Ellen White, you know, rebuking them for the bad influence they had on their husbands. So, so you've got all kinds of dynamics here happening. So, those who did not know her as well tended perhaps to see her a little bit more on a pedestal, a little bit more with awe and, and respect. On the other hand, you've got, and I think this comes out in the biographies of Uriah Smith, John Andrews, the biography of A.G. Daniels, the biography of W. Prescott, these biographies of some of these early pioneers who remained within the denomination, even though they had difficult moments with James and Ellen White, shows that in spite of having disagreements, not understanding some of the testimonies, they would simply put those aside, uh, not let perhaps anxiety, angst, anger, resentment bubble to the surface. They would let that perhaps go aside and would continue to work within the denomination and continue to work with very fallible human beings. That's what Butler did. Butler many times said in his letters of reply to Ellen White or reply to somebody else, I don't understand this testimony. Why is it that he is not understanding it? Well, because that is not his recollection of the facts. That is not his interpretation of the facts. But she has a point of view. She does not. Agree. He does not agree with it. What is he going to do about it? Just stand up in pulpit and denounce her? And, and tell everybody that she's a false prophet? No, never, 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 never will he do that. John Andrews will not do that. Uriah Smith will not do that. A.G. Daniels will not do that. They will simply be quiet and uh, put aside their feelings or perhaps their anxiety and continue to work in a submissive way. They will submit ultimately to whatever Ellen White demands of them. And it, it's not... 
abdicating their faith. It's not abdicating their rational capacities to understand a situation. It is for the sake of the denomination, for the sake of the work and the mission of the church, that individual cannot take a public stand against Ellen White. That, that is not fair. It cannot be done because together as a group, they've accepted that she is a messenger of the Lord. In, in spite of the difficulties they have, that's the bottom line. And that's how they handled it. The very last, just to conclude my answer to you here, Lauren, the very last series of articles that Butler wrote for the review, uh, it's about a year or two before he dies. So 1916, 1917. It is a long series of articles defending the biblical gift of prophecy as manifested in the life of Ellen White. Wow. Yeah. At the end of his life. After all that. After all of that, the last thing he does is to defend the ministry of Ellen White in the denomination. Wow. <laughs> so perhaps that says something about him. That is. I, mean, I guess it says something about a lot of us who have... Uh made that bargain with made a bargain with the church where he said, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet about my heterodoxies as long as you uh, let me continue to preach the gospel. And uh, I think a lot of us have pastors uh, did that. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, follow up with this. Uh, Loughborough, did Loughborough know them personally? Uh, yes, he did. But Loughborough, Loughborough is a different personality than, than, Andrews, Butler, Smith, right. a, a more mellow person, um, not 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 the same kind of abrasiveness <laughs> that the other. I, I think of Loughborough as being the the myth maker. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yes, he, for sure. He grabbed onto every possible miracle story and put yeah. it in, in into his his works. And uh, a lot of the things that I was taught growing up that aren't even mentioned anymore, like holding up the Bible and all that stuff. That all came from Loughborough. Yes, it did. I, I read it when I was very young, and uh, he seemed to be self-consciously yeah. creating the myth of Ellen White, even though he knew her so well. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. That's all. I'm thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. I'm going to go to Emmanuel. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Fortin, I was a proverbial in the candy store listening to you. <laughs> I have three questions for you, but before I ask them, I would like to make a disclaimer. I understand if you don't want to answer any one of them, it's fine. Question number one, the distinction of the law in Galatian, the church came to his conclusion on theological slash doctrinal ground or exegetical ground, the early church, uh, Butler and company? A little bit of both. I mean, they compare scripture to scripture. In Galatians chapter 3, there's reference to angels, a mediator, the law being added. Added to what? Well, added to the other law that's already there. So by doing this exegesis based on a you know King James Version Bible, Bates and company came to that conclusion that this law in Galatians referred to the ceremonial law. You now, strangely enough, when I was a young convert to Adventism, that's what I was taught. That's how I was taught to interpret Galatians, Romans, Ephesians, all of these passages, making that distinction between the two. So nothing new here. Okay, my second question. I heard under the grapevine that Butler became sick because of back and forth with Ellen White. She didn't want to tell him exactly what was the law in Galatian. Under the grapevine, so I don't say it's an accurate statement. I want to hear from the historian. I, uh, well, partly true, partly true. Uh, the reasons why he had this burnout progressively adding up from the summer of 86 until well into uh, 1891, 92, 93. He was sick for many, many years. It partly was that he could not understand why Ellen White was so ambiguous, uh, futzing around, semi-endorsing 
<clears throat> Jones and Wagner in their understanding of the law in Galatians or the law in general. And, and, and he knew in his deepest, you know, understanding and his, way deep down in his soul, he knew that she did not agree with them uh, when it came to that. And, uh, and to him, that was, that was part of his burnout. Not, not all, not all, but it was certainly part of his burnout. Uh, part of the burnout is also the fact that he was overworked, uh, did not delegate responsibilities, the job had become a monster, and and it, it almost killed him. But you, you are right. One of the big factors for his burnout is his relationship with Ellen White. Okay, last question. Ellen White, public humiliation. It was to educate him or to punish him? Oh, wow. That's a very perceptive question you have. You know, I, I, I cannot read Ellen White's thoughts here. I, I cannot ascribe motives to her. I cannot do that. Nobody can do that. Try but, to look on the tea leaves. I know. I, I could try to read the tea leaves, but I don't have her cup of tea. <laughs> so uh, so let, let me say here, uh, it's probably a little bit of a little bit of both, and I will say both because of this. The context of the late 19th century is a context that is very different from ours. In that context, so many years ago, coming from perhaps uh, an American Midwest um, context where you've got to rebuke your neighbor in order to make sure that he will be saved in heaven. You've got to tell him his sins and you've got to lead him to repentance. If you don't do that, his uh, the fact that he is lost will be asked of you. Yeah, you will become responsible for somebody being lost. So, in a sense, the rebukes of Ellen White, yes, they're public. To help somebody be saved, uh, it, it, it is to make sure that he will get the message and hopefully repent of his sins and then be a better worker later on. Is it to punish? I don't know. That may be, but I don't know. Uh, would, would Ellen White think this way? You know, if we want to put her on a pedestal of some kind, we would probably say, no, she would not act like that. But perhaps a human being would perhaps unconsciously, you know, think that way. He needs a good rebuke. You know, he needs a good slap in the face or kick in the butt because he's been acting so bad as a GC president. Um, but again, you know, I'm just rambling on here. I cannot read Ellen White's thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Emmanuel. I'm going to go to Ed Zinke. Go ahead, Ed. Yes, um, Mr. Fortin. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, Jones and Wagner and righteousness by faith. It is my understanding that uh, Ellen White um, thought after 1888 that the church, the Adventist church, had gone off in the wrong direction. That She believed that righteousness by faith was something that individual Christians could actually achieve, maybe just momentarily, I think, or maybe I'm wrong there. But uh, so in her mind, it was a rift that, uh, and I'm not sure where Butler stood on that, but uh, there was a rift that never got rectified while she was alive. That's my first question. What did Ellen White believe regarding righteousness by faith? It's a complex question. Can I answer it here in a couple of minutes? Um, for some, in, in some of her writings, the concept of righteousness by faith is exactly the same as justification by faith. In fact, in the Greek, it's the same word. In English, we've got two words explaining the same thing. But in, in, in Greek, it's the same thing. In English, however, uh, there's a lot of people who understands righteousness by faith to be something and then justification by faith to be something else. 
In some of the writings of Ellen White, it's very clear that she understands righteousness by faith to be the same thing as justification by faith. It happens at the moment of, of our conversion, when somebody asks for the forgiveness of sin because we accept Jesus as our Savior. At that very moment, our sins are forgiven. That is justification by faith. It's the same thing. Righteousness by faith, however, for some people, it is what happens next. The work of sanctification, of growing in grace, of keeping the commandments of God, and to the extent that there is sanctification, there's also ultimately going to be salvation. Easily here, you got a uh, you, you got added to the equation the necessity of good works of obedience in order for one to be saved. What do we mean by this today? Uh, Adventism is still divided today. There are still a lot of people all over the place when it comes to these concepts. We're not very clear. And I would say there's a lot of confusion still in Adventism. So where was Adventism in the time of Ellen White? Well, just as confused as it is today. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And I won't add for that clarification. <laughs> the, se the second question okay. is, uh, um, so taking her writing on the Law of Galatians, for example, as was brought up earlier, I have a difficult time deciding or discerning between what is actual prophecy, because she is a, quote, prophet, and what is just uh, like critique, for example. Is that a critique, or how many of her writings are just adding more in for understanding to what was written in the in the uh, old or new Tens testament and of course uh, many adventists are hardcore you know like just about everything she did was prophecy so anyways i don't know if you can answer that one i'm not sure what your question is well how how much of her writings and and this is such a broad question but uh, how much of her writings are actual prophecy in the in the sort of uh, true sense of the word, if that's a... Well, okay, but in the true sense of the word, what do you mean by prophecy? Uh, received from a vision? Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, sorry. Okay, yeah. very good. Well, in that case, uh, oh, boy, I tell you, the, the, the jury is out on this one. When Fred Veltman did his study of the sources of the book, The Desire of Ages... You know, he compared the Desire of Ages and the antecedent of some of the chapters of the Desire of Ages to Spirit of Prophecies, Volumes 2 and 3, and then even before that, some of the articles and the smaller books of Ellen White on the life of Jesus. When he compared all of that to some of the non-Adventist authors that Ellen White had in her library, Fleetwood, Harris, and, and a few others, Melville, and he compared those he, he could find, he did find, a number of examples where there is correspondence. It's, it's obvious that Ellen White, when she wrote The Desire of Ages, she followed the thought, the basic ideas, even some of the vocabulary coming from these other authors. There is correspondence there. So she borrowed from those authors. Within the, text, within the context of, of, of the time, uh, was it plagiarism or was it, you know, uh, an unofficial uh, borrowing? You just keep it quiet. Okay, the jury is out on that one, and there's a lot of conversation could still be going, be that as it may. Now, what do we do with a number of the other passages of the Desire of Ages that are uh, non-biblical details? You no, know, a story happens to, in the life of Jesus. Ellen White gives a comment regarding that particular part of the gospel story. And that little details or that series of details is, is not in the scriptures. It's not in the gospel. It's coming from somewhere else. Did it come from a vision? I mean, typically, that's usually what we would say, that it comes from a vision. Fred Veltman came to the conclusion that likely no. It's just that we have not found the secondary source from which this is coming so, just to answer your question, when Ellen White wrote testimonies, she very often claimed to have visions from God. So, she would get up at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock. She would write these testimonies to various individuals. 
and then she would, you know, write these letters and then send them out. When she wrote books uh, that are commentaries on scripture, uh, very often probably she borrowed a lot of the material coming from some other authors and and did that come from a from a vision not sure thank you dr Furtan. i'm going to go to dr ray and ask if you can lower your hand or um, if you ask if you can unmute please hi dr Fortan. how are you hello courtney nice to see you <laughs> nice to hear you and see you too um, I have a quick question um, that kind of piggybacks on um, what Lauren said at the very beginning. So at, towards the end, you said that your uh, that her nephew had written to Butler asking about, um, you know, his recollection of Ellen White's writings in the role of the church. And so that was in 1907. And I know she was still alive for uh, another few years so I'm just kind of wondering why do you know what was the impetus for him um even writing and asking that question like were there doubts or were there concerns or mm -hmm. what sort of motivated that um and, and maybe you don't know but um what was going on where he felt that he needed to sort of get some information about Butler's recollection yeah, that's a, a good question. Basically, what's happening is that in the early 1900s, uh, Belden is having issues uh, with the Review and Herald uh, regarding royalties of the hymns that he has written and composed and that have been published in the hymnals of the church. The Review and Herald is having, for various reasons, uh, is basically saying, well, your aunt says this, your aunt says that. And in all of in all of the difficulties that Belden is having, he's trying to understand, you know, perhaps how he could argue his case uh, with the Review and Herald, in, in distinction from what his aunt has said uh, regarding the use of royalties, and and that's that's part of the context here why he's asking yeah. Butler for some information, recollections, and perhaps it, but there's also to some extent. Uh, Butler is getting aged, is getting older, and it, there's a curiosity on the part of Belden wanting to have some facts before before they disappear, before nobody mm -hmm. knows anymore. So that also is happening on the part of Belden. But Belden has had a number of issues with church leadership, and he's building a case. Okay. Do you know why he wouldn't just ask his aunt at the at that time, or was she not? well enough to ask or what was going on why he didn't um i that i don't know i i have the impression that they were not on good speaking terms mm. but it, be that as it may he could have written to her and I, there is correspondence between ellen white and frank belden but uh just to be precise about your an answer to your question i yeah. don't really know okay okay that's really interesting thank you thank you courtney Thank you, Dr. Ray. I'm going to go to Richard. Richard, do you have something to share with us today? Thank you. It's Richard Fayola here in Bellingham. Um, thank you for the presentation this morning. I wish you'd speak more to the series of, of articles that Butler wrote. I think there were six of them or so on degrees of inspiration. Those would have been so helpful had they been widely accepted in keeping the Adventist church from its uh, falling into fundamentalism in the, the early 1920s and 30s, mm. maybe 40s, even the day. Um, Ellen White, some months or a couple of years later, did comment that those articles should never have been written. Um, so maybe you can flesh that out a little bit more for us. I think it's important. Okay, thank you. That's that. Okay, very good. Uh, very very good comment. Uh, very good question. I'm looking at the book here, and uh, I have a chapter in the book that is called "The Perplexities of Inspiration." And in that chapter, I I stop the uh, narrative of the story, and I just spend a good chapter explaining an, uh, two or three series of articles that Butler wrote on the concept of inspiration. 
Butler knew firsthand that the writings of Ellen White came from different sources, that her inspiration did not come always from visions, and that like perhaps some parts of the scriptures, uh, the household of Chloe had talked to Paul about the problems of the church in Corinth, and Paul writes 1 Corinthians. The content of 1 Corinthians is not coming from visions. It's coming from a response to what he thinks, understands is happening in Corinth, and he uses his wisdom, his understanding of Scripture, to write the letter 1 Corinthians. Now, we consider that letter to be inspired, but the inspiration behind the letter is very different from the inspiration of the book of Revelation or the prophecies of the book of Daniel or some of the prophecies of the book of Zechariah, who are, you know, visions of, of, of beasts and events that the author is writing into a book. And that is also different from the way the Gospels were written, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, the books of Kings, the books of Chronicles, the book of Ruth. Uh, these books are historical books. The author or authors wrote these books out of recollection, the stories that had been passed on from generation to generation, and they are put into books. They are historical books. They are not based upon vision. And now there's a third group of writings in the scriptures, which we called wisdom literature. It's the book of Job, the Psalms, the Proverbs. The Psalms and the Proverbs in particular are writings that arise out of the spirituality, the prayers, the wisdom of the authors of those Psalms and Proverbs. Butler said that if we look at scripture carefully, we see different ways he used the word degrees of inspiration, that somehow the, <laughs> the Holy Spirit did not work through the individual in the same way in the writing of the text of Scripture we have today. And very little of it came from direct visions from God. The fact that he used the word degrees of inspiration led people to think that some things are more inspired than others, more or less. While he was simply trying to say, and some of the articles use synonyms like manners, ways of inspiration. Now, everything is inspired. Everything is good, useful for instruction, correction, and, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3. But not everything is inspired in the same way with the same intensity uh, or, or um, imminence coming from the Holy Spirit into the life of the individual. There are differences of inspirations. The end product is still inspired, but the way it was came about to be written is different. That's what he meant by degrees of inspiration. He meant by that manners, ways of inspiration. And indirectly, he was referring to the writings of Ellen White because he knew that the writings of Ellen White were not written all in the same way. Like the prior question that was asked there, some of the writings of Ellen White toward people, did they come from a vision? Perhaps some of them, yes, but some of them, no. They came from Ellen White's wisdom. They came from Ellen White's sense of pastoral ministry, of understanding the situation, and of being able to relate to this individual. And if you're not careful, this is likely what's going to happen. Not necessarily from a direct vision from heaven. And Butler knew that. Butler knew very well that Ellen White wrote some of her testimonies out of somebody talked to her. Somebody told her this, that, or the other. And it just so happens that um, that person did not relate the facts properly, and she's misunderstanding some things. Some things may have come from visions. Particularly, they would be convinced that a testimony came from a vision, a direct prophecy there, so to speak, when she said, I saw. 
I saw this, I saw that. If she did not say, I saw, to them, it was likely, more likely, hmm, maybe that's her opinion. And it does not have the same intensity, the same value. So maybe it's more human than divine. And so you get all into all kinds of nuances of influence. Is Ellen White speaking from God or from her own authority, her own wisdom, her own point of view? And that became very conflictual. So you're right. A couple years later, Ellen White said, reflecting on the series of articles George Butler had written in 1884 about the degrees of inspiration, she said that series was not inspired. Okay, sure. I mean, Butler did not claim to be inspired when he wrote it. Nonetheless, and I showed that in the biography in that special chapter on inspiration, there are a number of instances where Ellen White wrote at about the same time in private testimonies and in some of her writings, where <laughs> she endorses many of those points that Butler made in that series of articles. So although she dismisses them right offhand, nothing is inspired, well, in many of her own writings, she agreed with what he said. Yes, there are levels, manners of the way the Holy Spirit communicates messages to her and to the Bible authors. So it's not clear cut. And I will agree with you as I conclude here that if we had better understood what Butler is trying to say in that series on inspiration, we might have avoided some of the problems uh, we have had for over a century with the writings of Ellen White. Butler had some wisdom there, first-hand wisdom on trying to understand and solve the difficulties within Adventism. Thank you for your question. Read more. I, You know, I sound like I'm selling a book on Sabbath here today, but okay. that's. <laughs> I'm going to go to Ed Reifsnatter. Ed. Good afternoon. Uh, Dennis, Good afternoon. this has been a fascinating uh, presentation and discussion. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, I want to <clears throat> ask two questions. They're closely related and sequential. Um, I was very interested in your statements about Butler late in his life, uh, affirming Ellen White and, and her ministry. Now, reading between the lines, that spoke to me, and I may be wrong, that uh, he somehow came to terms with the conflicting scenarios he lived with Ellen White during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. he, he somehow rather, I hate to use this, I don't use this word pejoratively, but he somehow rather rationalized everything so that in the end he was willing to say on balance, um, I would affirm her, affirm her work. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, that implies that we as individuals and our church as a community need to use some judgment about Ellen White as opposed to just blindly accepting things? Do we need to, um, pick and choose? Um, or do we need to alter our view of her ministry and her methods, basically, somehow? Uh, in other words, if we're going to go through the same experience that Butler went through to, in the end, affirm her ministry, which many of us are probably challenged to do right now, uh, at least as we've heard the story told, do we need to do like Butler did and somehow rationalize the positive and the negative uh, the confusing and the things you can't understand to come to an affirmation that on balance she was a positive influence? Well, that's a beautiful question and um, a, a deep one. Let me say a couple things. I, I, I would say yes. I think there's a rationalization that's happening on the part of Butler. 
And toward the end of his life, I think it happens because of something that has happened between him and her. You see, at the end of 1888, when this whole conflict comes to a head and Butler resigns from his offices, by the way, he resigns from his offices, he's not kicked out. He is going to die. The doctor has said to him, if you don't give up your responsibilities, you don't have too long to live. And so he resigns from his responsibilities and, and Ellen White says, finally, good riddance. And Ellen White will plead with him to stay in Battle Creek until the end of December so he could attend the week of prayer that she will attend and that uh, I think Waganoa Jones will conduct so that he could be there at the end of the week of prayer in Battle Creek to confess his sins and to return to the Lord because he has acted badly in this whole conflict with Jones and Wagner for the last three years or two and a half years by now. He refuses to do that. He will not submit. He is not able to. He's burned out. He's mentally unstable. He's got some mental health issues big time by then. He has to get out of Battle Creek and he goes to Florida. Ellen White will tell him over and over, unless you repent and be converted, you will not see the kingdom of God. She is telling him he is not a converted man. Butler refuses over and over to accept that verdict. Butler is from a Baptist heritage. One is converted when one turns one's heart to Jesus, accepts Jesus as one Savior, confesses sins and repents. Butler is convinced that he has been a born-again Christian since the late teens, early 20s, and that he has never left the Lord Jesus. Yes, he is an imperfect human being. He's an imperfect church leader. He has made mistakes, but he believes that Jesus is his Savior. He is not unconverted, and he does not need to be converted. Ellen White does not think so, but Ellen White, I think, has an understanding of conversion, which means submission to the message that the Lord is giving him through her. But mm. he does not understand it that way. When the relationship between George Butler and Ellen White picks up again in the 1892-93, there's a couple of letters that are exchanged between them for about six months or a year while she's in Australia. In one of the letters, she brings that up again. I hope you are a converted man. I'm paraphrasing here. He answers her back with a very long letter, basically saying, I have never left the Lord Jesus. I do not need to be converted. I have always been faithful to the Lord Jesus to the best of my ability by God's grace. She, do, she refuses to continue the correspondence. So in planted in George Butler's mind, is the fact that she does not believe he is a converted man because he is refusing to say that she was right all along in 1886 to 1888. Same thing will happen again in the early 1900s. And after he retires from the Southern Union Conference, same thing will happen again, particularly over the conflict in Nashville. I, he is not sure that she believes he is converted and will be in the kingdom. And that nags him terribly in the last 10 years or so of his life. From 1907, this last conflict with her, until, he dies in until she dies in 1915, the last letter he writes to her before she dies is a letter in which he upholds her, believes in her, I've always loved you, uh, we, yes, we've had our moments of disagreements, but I've always upheld you. I know you're a messenger of the Lord. He says that to her in the last letter he writes to her before she dies. Willie White will not read this letter to his mother because she's too weak. And Butler feels a little bad about this. And the last series on the spirit of prophecy that he writes a year or two before he dies now, which is three years after Ellen White, is again perhaps to say to the entire world church, we've had our moments of disagreement, but I always uphold, you know, uh, Ellen White, she's, she's a messenger of the Lord, 
and so on. So my uh, long answer to your question here, why is he rationalizing all of this? Because personally, he he is nagged by the fact that he does not think that she looks up to him, that she knows he will be in the kingdom. And that really hurts him. And he's trying his best to convince her that he is a true believer in her ministry. I think Willie White is con is convinced, but he's not sure that the mother is. So do we do the same? Now, second part to your question, do we do the same? Well, I think Butler did that. Arias Smith did that. J.N. Andrews did that. A.G. Daniels and many others. They received messengers from Ellen White. They could not understand them. They could not see how they could put them into practice. Nonetheless, for the sake of the church, rationalizing away here, they would still uplift her ministry and um, leave, leave it at that. Um, so do we do the same? Some of us do the same. Some of us don't. We, we, we do our best here. But there's a, you know, recently I've had a conversation with a number of retirees, some of my colleagues in Adventist studies, Many of them, now older than me, they're in the 70s and 80s, are beginning to think that, yeah, we've had our issues with Ellen White, and uh, we've deconstructed her a great deal. But there is nonetheless something about her ministry that we cannot rationalize, that we cannot put aside. We need to uphold that there is something mysterious there about her ministry, and we need to discover that perhaps a little bit more. I think some of that is happening for all of us. I, I hope I've answered your question here. In yeah, the it's very good. Uh, I'd like to do a follow-up, and, and you you touched on it. Um, I, I'm aware that there's a group of you meeting. You met at PUC in, uh, not long ago. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, last night I listened to the... Uh, uh, Spectrum's podcast where Alex interviewed Eric Anderson about that meeting. Mm. And it's, it's a good interview. Uh, in the interview, Eric spoke uh, complimentary about your contributions to the discussion there at PUC. Uh, I felt for some time that we need a, a, a different narrative about Ellen White than the one that we, the standard narrative that's been put forward, particularly by the church bureaucracy for many years. Um, if you could I write, if you could write a new narrative about Ellen White that you would like the Adventist church at large to adopt, would you be willing to say what you think the high points of that new narrative would look like? That's a good question. I'm going to escape by saying I'll think about it. <laughs> 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 and uh, you know, I've got a couple works, a couple writing uh, projects in the works that, uh, and one of them will certainly uh, have a couple chapters on that. I don't have finalized thoughts on this, and uh, and yes, I I think that's needed, and I will I will work on that. Thank you. I'm going to go to Dr. Lofthouse. Thank you. Go Jan. ahead. Yeah, and Denny, thank you for <clears throat> placing Ellen White in a context as you have. It's very broadening for me. Uh, I've always had that, that some of these concepts, but it's very helpful from a historical perspective as you've you placed it. Um, and perhaps I'll echo somewhat of what Ed was just coming to, which has to do somewhat with how should we respond and his request of you. But perhaps I'd having sort of a traditional view of Ellen White and many of her messages. I would find it helpful if she herself were critical of some of her statements, some of her actions. Um, do such examples exist? And if so, do they help us understand more how to place 
her actions in the long term? Um, so did Ellen White apologize? Yeah, or, that's kind of what I'm asking, yes. Or backtrack. We have very, very few examples of Ellen White apologizing for being wrong. We do have some examples in her relationship with James, where the two of them were offending each other and having a difficult time in 1876, so a few years before he died. We have very few examples of Ellen White apologizing to anybody else outside her family for being wrong in one of her testimonies or saying something that was not right or too strong. I found one letter to George Butler in, to, in which she apologizes mm -hmm. for being wrong and mm -hmm. accusing him of doing something that he said to her, I'm sorry, sister, but I wasn't there. You mm -hmm. placed me there. You accusing me of doing this, saying this during this meeting Sister, I wasn't there. And in the response, she apologizes. And you see, that's part of that's part of George Butler's understanding of her ministry. Right. And that she did not always have everything right. And it's okay because she's a human being. Yeah. No, and, that, that's helpful. Uh, and I guess what I'm asking also, was there a large degree of spin management, whether it was her or the people around her? in controlling those circumstances that would prevent her saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Perhaps. Again, perhaps we, we place ourselves in the context of the late 19th century, where she's, she's claiming and people are upholding the, the claim to having a prophetic ministry, inspiration from God, direct visions from God, visits from angels from God, and that itself brings about an aura of, of responsibility and also some kind of an authority that comes along. Yeah. If you show, I'm putting myself in that context, if you show that you're human, that you make mistakes, then what people are going to say, you know? If Ellen White did not want people to understand inspiration in the way that George Butler said it, it was in in part because she did not want people to pick and choose what they would read from her, what they would listen from her. They would accept this, but not that. She did not want that to happen. She wanted people to receive everything she said and apply it to the best of their circumstances to their lives. She did not want people to pick and choose, which people wanted to do. So you've got, you've got a, a difficult situation there where on the one hand, she probably knew that she was not perfect and would admit that to herself. But to say that publicly would be damaging her gift. You see, it's not the same today. We don't think that way today. Right. You have a pastor yeah. in the local church. Your pastor makes a mistake. Uh, three Sabbaths later, he, he apologizes during the sermon. Uh, okay, everybody you know, says, amen, let's, let's keep going. Uh, but not in her day. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I had memories, and this is a little vague, that she disagreed in an astronomical terms with, I think, Joseph Bates about some heavenly bodies or things that she may have gotten it wrong. But I don't think I ever heard her retract any of those. Is there truth no. to that? No. The way Ellen White retracted something is by making it go out of print. Oh. <laughs> and, and and that's part of why we're having so much issues with the early writings of Ellen White. Uh, there's a number of, of, of little things that are being said in the early writings that, wow, they're problematic. You know, for example, the geology of, um, well, that's not early because that's later, but the geology of earthquakes and, and volcanoes or um uh, racial provenance amalgamation of men and beast you know and things like this yeah. uh, comments are made once here maybe twice and then after that it never appears again well i think there's a reason why they never appear again it's because they were hoping they would be, go out of print and nobody would see them again and then it would not become an issue but now we have everything in databases and uh, we have all the reprints and everything is available and we're able to see the gamut of, of all these little things.
So one way of apologizing is yeah. by letting it go. Yeah, thank you. I, I certainly hope that we can uh, continue to follow perhaps as George Butler did. And I think that's very helpful to look at it in that way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, this thank is you, Lori. Dr. Lapis. I think she did retract a few messages, didn't she? Uh, like the reform dress and... Uh, and yeah, uh, and, yeah and, she, and she nuanced them. She reinterpreted them. Yes, she did. Yes. And she and she usually she usually blamed it on God, I think. It was God who took it away from her. Interesting. I, I just want to apologize. I've been uh, turning my picture off because I'm getting sporadic messages and my internet is unstable. So if you see me disappear, I'm still here. But yep. I just wanted you to know that's what that's about. I'm going to Clarence next. Clarence, tell us what's on your mind. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Doctor, for this presentation. I have just um, three comments, three or four. If Gina will allow a fourth one, we'll see. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that the uh, the reasoning coming from the pioneers that um, Aaron uh, that the, uh, the, the 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 Ten Commandments being placed inside of the Ark would give them eternal validity. Mm -hmm. we would apply the same reasoning to Aaron's rod that budded. That was also in the ark. It was not on the side. It was right inside. Yep. But we don't do that. In fact, in New Testament terms, the Aaronic priesthood is gone. And Jesus Christ is aligned with Melchizedek, not with Aaron. So that um, reasoning from, from tables of stone inside of an ark is a poor argument, in fact. And we should look elsewhere if you want to hold on to the Ten Commandments. Then um, a second comment is, it was mentioned that, um, that they are one of the reasons why we hold on to Sabbath and so on and so on is because it was administered by angels. Well, at the time that the New Testament is being written, there is a new idea coming in, in religious circles wherein the divine intervention, direct divine intervention is being downplayed because we are human and God is this transcendent being and he would not condescend to directly interfere with us. So we have to pass, we have to come to him through an intermediary. And so God acts with us through angels. That idea was coming in. And it grew until in some circles, Jewish circles and some others, even the very name of God was, uh, was put aside. And God came to be called Adonai and not Yahweh in order to keep him away from direct intervention in human circles. Let the angels do it and let not the Lord himself be involved. That was one comment. I'd like to um, I'd like to mention also that um, when it comes to Ellen G. White, it seems to me you will tell me if I'm wrong, Doctor. It seems to me that Ellen White had a problem dealing with opposition. Anybody who contradicted, anybody who opposed, anybody who suggested otherwise, would receive a beating. Am I right or wrong? You will tell me. But it seems to me, it seems to me that the, the persons, the individuals who were closest to Ellen White, Khan Wright, who lived in her house, what's his name, the president, we mentioned Daniels. Daniels, who knew her very well, personal secretary of James and Ellen and so on, and living practically in her house. And also Butler, whom we just mentioned a while ago, all of these, the persons who were closest to her, had some very different ideas about her, ideas that, uh, that were put aside. I think somewhere that from the very beginning, the church itself encouraged a certain thinking about Ellen White. Why is that? I've been trying to find a reason why it is. Maybe it's because there was a movement of prophetism in America at the time, and everybody wanted to have a prophet. Maybe that's it. I don't know. You will tell me. In any case, in any case, Ellen White came out 
and the church rather, what's the word, encouraged, hid, or whatever you want to call it, whatever would seem to downplay Ellen White. I give you one example. In early writings, and that troubled me from my very earliest days as an Adventist. In early writings, Ellen White, writing about the shut door, wrote saying that the believers, including herself, I understood it to mean the believers had a false idea of a door being shut and people not being able to get to salvation anymore. And immediately after that, st that statement in early writings, I think it's still there in the version that I have, it is still there. The editors put in small print something, say something saying to that effect, the author of these words never believed or did not believe that the door of mercy was shut. I nearly jumped when I read it as an early Adventist. I said, what's happening here? It seems to me that's exactly what she was saying, that the people in the earliest days didn't think that uh, or thought that the door of mercy was shut. But here were the leader, the, the, the publishers, Pacific Press or whoever, saying that she didn't think so. And it seems to me that that has been a policy of our church from the very beginning. We will pass over the sponge. We will clean it up. We will say whatever come would, would make it look nicer, palatable, acceptable, and we can stomach it. We will not expose Ellen White to the vagaries, to the inconsistencies, and to the failures of ordinary human mortals. That's my take. Tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> I think, you know, we're moving away from Butler uh, into how to understand Ellen White. From Butler's perspective, I'll just well, it's come all back. wrapped up. Excuse me, but it's all involved. It's all involved. We're dealing with the Seventh Day Adventist Church. We don't want to deal with Butler as an as a maverick somewhere, a lone ranger. No, we're talking about Seventh Day Adventism and Butler within Seventh Day Adventism. Um. If you have read one of the latest books by George Knight, uh, Ellen White's Afterlife, I think you will find that in that book, you know, he agrees uh, wholeheartedly with many of the things you have said, that since the death of Ellen White, uh, the 1920s, 30s, all the way to the 70s, there's been a mythology that has arisen regarding Ellen White to efface uh, any weaknesses, humanity from Ellen White and making her or presenting her myth mythologically almost as a perfect human being, also a perfect messenger in all of her writings, in all of her testimonies, and, and so on. So yes, I think you, you, you are right in describing a situation in Adventism today uh, and this book of George Knight and some others uh, by other authors, you know, concur with what you said. There were many of the early uh, uh, early uh, pioneers, as you've mentioned, uh, Ken Wright, uh, Butler, uh, Daniels, uh, Andrews, who knew her personally, having lived in their homes or very close to them as neighbors. And they knew that these people were fallible human beings and could not give them the level of, um, of perfectionism that we tend perhaps to uh, ascribe to her today. On another point, I think also it's good to say that Ellen White realized herself that she grew in her understanding of a number of issues, that she did not always know everything perfectly, uh, that some of her early writings on some topics, uh, the shut door, um, the, the divinity, the Godhead, over time changed. She may not have specifically said, oh, I used to say that, now I say that, I say this. Uh, no, she would not say it that way. But certainly her writings show that there's been a progression, a growth, a change in a number of, of areas of study. Again, I would say I would fall back on, not to excuse her, but at least to understand her, that in the 19th century in which she lived, uh, an author, uh, somebody who claimed some kind of prophetic role or some leadership role, did not apologize publicly about mistakes. It was not done that way in those years. And, but... If you compare, you, you see that the change has happened, that a different opinion has happened, 
that a different point of view has happened over time. And we say, well, okay, the humanity is coming through. Uh, we understand that, even though perhaps it's not being mentioned openly that way. So, uh, you know, yes and no, uh, you're right, you're wrong. Uh, or, or I just, I'm, I'm just nuancing perhaps what you have said. And, and many of the early pioneers would think that she was a very human being. I just Thank want you. to observe that from from what you're telling us about Butler today, it sounds like he was able to draw a line between the Adventist church and Ellen White, and that he seemed to be very committed to the church wherever she fell on, on it. I mean, and I'm not saying he didn't believe she was a prophet. It sounds like he did. But he saw the vision of the church moving forward as what his real goal was. Oh, very true. That's a very good observation. That's uh, honestly, that's his his bigger his bigger vision was that of Adventism, and right. he was With, and he was her. very right. committed to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Dr. Hemmings and ask you to unmute. I see you have. Go ahead. Thank you for your patience. Oh, thank you, Danny, for your presentation. Hello, Olive. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. Very informative. Uh, very eye-opening. I want to ask, you know, as I listen to these, you know, I'm, let me confess, I tend to be a defender of Ellen White from a feminist perspective. And um, I want to ask, the, so I'm just, you know, telling you where I'm coming from and asking you the question. So, so <laughs> everything is out in the open. So I want to ask to what extent was there ambiguity towards Ellen White as a woman, you know, with all this, uh, what did I say, revelatory authority, and also as a woman in a period when women were now being accepted as vehicles of these special revelations in American history? You know, what was the dynamic there? What, what was going on? Well, how do you see that, you know, playing out in the way she and the leaders of the church were relating to each other? Honestly, I have not picked up in any of the readings I've done, in any of the correspondence, the primary sources, I have not picked up from any of them any nuances of doubting her because she was a woman. Okay. Not I have not picked that up. I, I never got a sense that they would not listen to her because she was a woman. Uh, to, to, to them, that did not seem to be an issue. Um, James White, uh, that did not seem to come from him either. Uh, no, she should be secondary to him. Well, mm -hmm. yes, in the 1876, they're about when the two of them are having their marital issues and their professional issues between themselves but apart from that no I, I i did not pick that from pick up any of that sense of she's a woman therefore oh well why should i listen to her uh, perhaps that will sound strange if there is any if there is any of that of that kind of gender issue that might have come come up strangely it came from the spouses of these men. Mm. Um, I did read a number of comments where Lentha Butler is castigating her husband, George Butler, because he's submissive too much to Ellen White. He says, mm. why in the world are you doing this? Uh, it seems that Harriet Stevens, who's married to uh, Arias Smith, uh, and, and, uh, and, and some of the other women there in... in, in that are associated with these men, they seem to have had a little bit of a different take on Ellen White. Um, was it jealousy? Was it um, she's a woman and she's got all that authority and we're women and we don't have it? But anyway, I don't think it came from the men. Okay. I didn't see it. Yeah, I, I from the little I read, I didn't see that either. But... Again, I wonder what were the dynamics back then? How, you know, because yes, she was still 
in an era, first wave of the women's movement, there was so much social foment around that, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just wondering, you know, how much did that play into the, that 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 sort of relationship? And I and I agree with you. It's quite likely that the women, the has the wives, would be more concerned, you know, about Ellen White please putting their husbands in submission when perhaps they were yeah. submitting to their husbands. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Thank so. you so much, Doctor Hemmings. I'm going to go to Grace Stovall. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for that interesting bit of history. We've been getting a lot of history on the church and so forth. The question that comes up in my mind is, how did the people, the leaders at that time, feel about an understanding of the role of the Holy Spirit. We have Christ saying that when he left, that was to be the guide for his followers. But yet it seems like the role of the Holy Spirit seems to be somewhat diminished in all of this because if each individual has equal access, as we claim to believe, to God, why the obsession with prophets to tell people how to live their lives or what's right and wrong? Is I, That's always been confusing to me. And even today, uh, to me, it still seems like we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, but sometimes I get the impression that because we're human, we have to have still another person tell us whether that's the Holy Spirit talking to us or not. That's what is your impression based that's, upon your history? That, thank you, Ray. That's an interesting comment. Um, I, I, I think that is part of the reasons why some of these early pioneers are having conflicts with Ellen White, because they do believe that the gifts of the Spirit are being given to every church member you know, they have an understanding of the doctrine of spiritual gifts, that everyone gets spiritual gifts. Now, Ellen White has the gift of wisdom and the gift of prophecy, and that gives her the authority to give messages to the church and to the church members. On the other hand, they believe that they also have the gifts of the spirit of wisdom, discernment, and then they follow meticulously one of the injunctions given in one of the letters of Paul. Test the spirits, prove all things, keep what's good. Uh, at the end of First Thessalonians, I believe, I'm paraphrasing here. So Ellen White gives them messages claiming to be from God. Well, they test those messages. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what the text of Scripture says, to test the gifts of the Spirit, test the prophecies. They do, and they don't agree with it. They say, well, no, that's not exactly this way. That's not a good interpretation of the events. And so, therefore, they just set it aside. So, if there are some conflicts between some of them with Ellen White, it is because they truly believe in the doctrine of spiritual gifts. And they will keep, the, first of all, they believe that Ellen White is endowed with a gift coming from the Holy Spirit. They believe that. They, they, they take that for granted. But within that, they also believe that she is not infallible, that not everything needs to be perfect, and that she could be mistaken or misunderstanding some, some issues or some interpretations or some things. These would be minor points. And so, therefore, they could you know, sift through all of this, keep what's good for them. If they don't understand something, just leave it aside. Maybe one day they will understand what Ellen White has said. Typically, that was George Butler's relationship with Ellen White. A good example in, in point is the one I gave, the first one I gave in 1875. That scathing rebuke she wrote to him about being a bad GC president. He really, really saw that as being coming from left field, 
had not expected it, was completely flabbergasted and floored by the testimony and, and, and the tenor of the testimony being so, so harsh on him. He read it many times, he said. He didn't understand it, didn't feel it applied to him. And even before he could write a reply to her, she had published it publicly in one of the testimonies and was even more confused by now making it public and publicly shaming him about having been a bad GC president. So, you know, he felt that he also had the gift of, of the Spirit you know, to be able to discern some of these things. And that led, in part, to the conflict between the two of them. So, uh, in answer to your question, yes, uh, there is a gift, but everybody has the gift as well. We have a couple more hands, uh, people who have spoken before, so I'm going to take the liberty of asking a question. <laughs> we have an expression that says, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And you've just done an exhaustive hit history on Butler. I'm interested to know what you learned from that historical journey that you think we need to be cautioned about as individuals, not necessarily as a church in our spiritual walk. Oh, perhaps a number of things I could say. Um, one of them would be the subtitle of the book, an honest but misunderstood church leader. It's easy for us as a denomination to spin things in such a way that uh, over time we come to really misunderstand an event, a person, and completely miss that this person had good intentions, was honest, did his or her best to do something, but uh, because we're shallow in our history, we're shallow perhaps in remembering events and remembering lessons from the past. We create mythologies that that uh, misunderstand people and and um, make it so that we're really not getting the right picture anymore. That's one thing I learned. I think the big picture within our own history. Uh, another thing that I certainly learned from this biography, and we've been going through that here for the last couple of hours, is that relationship between pioneers was very complex. It was not, it, it, their relationship between themselves was not an easy thing. Relating to Ellen White, to James White was not easy. Relating between themselves as leaders was not easy. It was a growing movement. The church was beginning. They were hoping Jesus is coming again, you know, within a year or so. They were making the best decisions they made. They clashed all the time. They were strong personalities. And in the mix of all of these factors, they tried their best to move ahead. Yet things were complex. And they, they, they could having difficulties relating with one another. Are things any different today? Perhaps not. I mean, that's one lesson in humility to keep in mind. To not, to not demonize people. The first biography of Butler that came out 45 years ago was titled Rugged Heart, The Life of George I. Butler, Rugged Heart. And ever since that time in Adventist history, Butler has been portrayed as rugged heart, unconverted, difficult, opinionated type of church leader, uh, who was on the wrong side of all the things that happened to the denomination. My take on this is, no, not really. Opinionated, strong leader, yes. Well, they were all like that. He was not alone. They were all opinionated and strong leaders. Some were very passive, aggressive. That's Uriah Smith. Uh, and, and others were right in your face. Um, that would be Butler, and that would be James White and uh, Morrison and a few others. But nonetheless, you know, we used titles like that one, Rugged Heart, and we created a mythology around Butler that has lasted for decades now, and at the same time, perhaps mis misinterpreted much of our history. Things were a whole lot more complex. I learned that much, certainly, from the biography. I think sometimes there's a tendency of people in the church to find a theory that was held by one of the church pioneers and kind of 
reinforced ideas that they have that makes it more valid or more important because an early leader had the same thought. But I, I feel like the whole church needs permission to think their own thoughts. And we are in an age that these people never dealt with. And I think that, um, you know, William Miller had a concordance in a Bible, and that's how he got going. It seems like we have so much more available to us in resources that there is going to be some breadth of thought that is entitled to just as much weight as the pioneers had. How's that for a radical idea? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. They did not expect we would be here for 180 years after 1844. Exactly. In All right. Fact, I'm going to go to, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's okay. I'm just going to let Lauren make an announcement. Lauren, go ahead. And then I've got three other uh, hands up and I'm going to go to the two who haven't spoken first and then Emmanuel, I'll let you bring it home. Okay. Go ahead, uh, yeah. Lauren. Yeah. But my announcement is simply to remind you that to next week, we have a uh, professor from Friedensau, uh, Andres Bachmann. Uh, Andres has spoken with us before. He, he uh, primarily works in the area of uh, counseling and chaplaincy and, uh, and pastoral theology. And uh, he is going to be talking to us about suicide. And uh, probably all of us have known someone who has suffered uh, deep depression and uh, possibly you have even known somebody who took their own life under the, the influence of that. So I think this should be a really excellent class and I'm looking forward to it. We try to, as I mentioned to you before, I've tried, we tried to do a, um, to try to vary our classes between pastoral theology and history and uh, exegesis and, you know, different point, different ways that we, we uh, understand our faith. And this is going to be certainly very pastoral um, and uh, help us to understand yes. people's emotions yes. and the results of them. So I just want to invite you, uh, in, if, no. if there's anybody you no. know who could use uh, this class, uh, invite them to come along, uh, invite them to join in on the class. Uh, it really does help to get the word out. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lauren. Jerry Connell, you're up. Can you let us know what thoughts this has provoked in you today? Um, sure. Uh, again, good presentation, uh, Dr. Fortin. Um, but um, so you've alluded to James White uh, and uh, uh, Butler having some very similar personalities in terms of workaholism, you know, not being able to delegate. Um, so I guess one of my thoughts was, I, I mean, because I remember in one of the letters James wrote to Ellen when they were separated in the, in the seventies uh, for a few years and couldn't be around each other. Um, you know, and James said, I, I don't need your head on my shoulders if I remember the quote right. Um, do you think maybe for Ellen with her attitudes and her um, letters of, you know, in your face, you know, you said, well, it's, you know, just the way they work back then, but could there be a element in Ellen's humanness that it's just power and control on her part? Uh, wow, um, I'm not sure what she would she have been conscious of that. I don't think so. Unconsciously, I I don't know. Uh, I know that recently, uh, Steve Daly in his psychobiography of Ellen White is claiming that that it was a power trip uh, that, that Ellen White wanted control of all these men and that she pushed her agenda upon them or forcefully, you know, by rebuking them would uh, would come to that conclusion. I don't have evidence that in her own personal, you know, correspondence with people that she would think this way. But did she was she perceived that way by some of them likely likely perhaps. Well ju that just the just the fact too though that other than apologizing to James, uh, you know, with the marital discord and the separation and 
two different states. Um, the fact that she didn't apologize, you know, I mean, if you apologize, it gives you a little less control. Uh, the, the, yeah. Because she didn't apologize to people, um, or as you cited earlier, uh, to Butler, yes, she apologized a, a little bit, but to many other people, and it wasn't just men that she rebuked, it was women as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. In those years, apologizing was uh, was not permissible of a leader. If a leader did that too often, the leader would lose credibility, authority, uh, influence. And I think Ellen White probably could have thought that way, certainly. And, and it would not come easy for her to apologize that she may have made a mistake. That would also bring a, a, a secondary issue for her, is that would she be credible on, on, on something else? If she claimed to say something from the Lord, the Lord has revealed to me that I should say this to you, not necessarily based upon a vision, but on, on her own personal wisdom and experience, would people continue to listen to her? And she was very afraid that people would not do that. They would not continue to listen to her. Maybe that was part of the dynamics for her not apologizing to people. Was it because she wanted to control them? I have no evidence of that. Do we, um, or do you have like any numbers in terms of uh, um, how, how many, like Canwright, DM Canwright on his book on Ellen White, um, you know, lists uh, quite a list of people who leaders of the church um, back in his day uh, who decided, okay, you know, the humanness I see in Ellen, that's little more than I can handle. Uh, I'm out of here. Any idea how many we lost that way or the church lost like that? I don't know. No, I'm sorry. I don't know. No. Okay. okay thank you again. For those, no, thank you for those questions. I think you've raised some really interesting issues. Thanks for that. Okay. I'm going to go to Samuel. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for the invite. I um, want to thank uh, Dr. Fortin, my chair of my dissertation, and his uh, publication of, uh, of uh, this book. I, I really appreciate the fact that we can look back at some of the um, figures, pioneers of our history, and be more charitable towards them, um, have a sense of uh, grace and mercy, and, and actually reframe the whole story as we have received it. I think that's very important. And I think that's one of the uh, um, benefits of receiving this kind of research that's been going on for a while. Um, I think also we need to remember that that is the same kind of charity we have to also give uh, actually the whites, Ellen and, and, uh, and James, because we we grew up, and of course I grew up in the church, as many of you did, well, I've been in the church for a while. We were given uh, this information on the different perspective, um, and now we're understanding it, and, and it's being reframed. And what, what has changed really is our understanding of it. The people are the same, and the way they were is the way they were. We just didn't tell the story correctly. We didn't have all the facts. But now that we see that they were real humans, we have to appreciate and say, well, they also need our grace. So I'm just giving a pastoral a plug into this very interesting dialogue that has been going on for a couple of years uh, in our midst. And I think it's important that uh, we give grace to the dead uh, as also we, the living, want to receive. But I actually have a question. Um, I think, and this was uh, prompted by what Ray was uh, talking about. Um, here we have uh, early on in the uh, amidst the pioneers um, this gift of the spirit, and they're trying to understand this dynamic, and yet we don't have a clear view of the Trinity, and especially the third person of the Godhead. How um, did this miss? understanding or lack of appreciation for the third person of the Godhead affect 
the way the pioneers related and understood the gift of the spirit and even the work of the spirit in their own lives and how that came to uh, affect their relationship with uh, Ellen White's writings. Um, well, thank you, Samuel, for for your comment there about grace, <clears throat> grace for the dead and grace for the living. But uh, but as far as your question is concerned, uh, how to relate to the spiritual gifts, given the fact that, oh, in the first uh, 40, 50 years of Adventism, um, most of them were anti-Trinitarian or at least non-Trinitarian and did not believe the Holy Spirit is a person, but only an influence, a power coming from God the Father. Um, I don't really know how to relate to that. I don't have an answer. I have not pondered that question. But would that prevent them from believing in the gifts of the Spirit, even if they believed that the Holy Spirit is only an influence from God rather than a person of God? It, it may just have been the same. I am. I, I'd have to think about it. I don't know, you know, what theological uh, conclusion or influence that concept may have had on their theology and how they would relate then to Ellen White. I am. I'm not sure. But thank you. It's something to think about. Thank you, Samuel. Emmanuel, can you unmute, please? And I'm going to let you bring it home for us here today. Yes, thank you. Uh, on a practical note, I am from Guadeloupe, French West Indies. And in my island, Ellen White cannot do anything wrong. She is probably equal to the Bible or above the Bible. Mm -hmm. My question for you, with all we discuss this afternoon, mm -hmm. how we bring Ellen White to the pew as who she really is, without being say, oh, he's an offshoot, oh, he's a renegade, is this, is that. How we do that? I don't know how you do that. I would perhaps suggest to you a few things. I would say that, uh, but again, you've said it yourself. <clears throat> if you bring any of these anecdotes and facts and perhaps more of the humanity of Ellen White to, to the forefront, people will think you are a heretic or a renegade. So I think George Knight has published a fair number of very good books on the life of Ellen White, the writings of Ellen White. Uh, about 20 years ago, he had that series on meeting Ellen White, reading Ellen White. They were very good little introduction. I don't know if they exist in French, but they were very good little introduction into uh, Ellen White and how to understand her more humanly, um, a more normal perspective. Uh, the more uh, polemical and apologetic book of about five years ago on Ellen White's afterlife is also a very good one that dispels a lot of the mythology about Ellen White. But there in the Guadeloupe and any, many of the other places in the world, Ellen White, as you say, is, is just on a pedestal and is not able to do anything wrong. It's very hard to undo this kind of mythology without creating such conflict within the church. Um, are, I don't know. I don't want to be defeatist, but are we too far along for anything like this to be undone? It would have to come from our leaders. It would have to come from uh, our church leaders. It would have to come from professional professors <clears throat> and teachers and pastors who would, in all honesty, perhaps preach and teach that a little bit more openly without fearing to be uh, uh, fired or, or let go of their employment. Uh, if it came from church leaders, we might have a better success, perhaps, to be able to present a, a, a more balanced view regarding Ellen White, one that would be more nuanced, more helpful. I don't know. You're, you're asking a good question, and I think the question comes up every time we talk about Ellen White here at this seminar. How do we let our people know so that a, a better view might be present out there. It's our challenge for all of us. Thank you for raising it. 